This is Cognitive Dissonance. Every episode, we blast anyone who gets in our way. We bring critical thinking, skepticism, and irreverence to any topic that makes the news, makes it big, or makes us mad. It's skeptical, it's political, and there is no welcome, Matt. This is episode 79, and we are joined by Dave Silverman from the American Atheist. Dave, even though there is no welcome, Matt, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, guys. So the story we're going to talk about is a story we did uh, address last week in the show. This is a story from the Friendly Atheist blog. Um, Bill Donahue, American Atheists want to draw blood with its latest <laughs> billboard. Catholic League's blowhard in chief. I still love that line so much. Um, said this about your latest billboard. This year, Dave Silverman wanted to make a big splash, so he decided to draw blood. It shows what he is made of. He and his supporters do not want to be left alone. They want to inflame the passions of those with whom they disagree. Unlike Christians, who do not provoke, harass, <laughs> or otherwise mock atheists. Silverman and his ilk want nothing more than to stick it to Christians at Christmas time. At Christmas time. It's who they are. So, Dave... You are the Rambo. You're drawing first blood here. I am the law. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, you know what? I, I, I love Bill Donahue. Uh, you know, the Catholic League, I don't know if you know this, the Catholic League is two guys, okay? It's Bill and Jeff. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's the, the blowhard in chief and the communications director who can't talk. Um, it's it, And I think they exist for the sole purpose of trashing people who criticize the Catholic Church. Um, if you talk about, you know, raping children, they call you a fascist. If you talk about corruption in the Catholic Church, they call you evil and drawing blood. Uh, this billboard that we put up, I'm, I'm actually quite thrilled with it. Uh, I like the billboard very much. When we first put it up, we put it up to be um, more mellow than our past boards. Uh, in fact, uh, a, one reporter that I talked to actually said, why, why have you taken such a mellow route this year? And he was right, because last year we called all religions scams. And, and the year before that, we said, oh, come on, everybody, you know it's a myth. This year we said, okay, uh, keep the Mary, dump the myth. We've got a picture of Santa Claus up there. We've got a picture of Jesus. And the picture of Jesus that we chose is a wooden sculpture of Jesus. It's not the clip art of Jesus with the blood and the rolling eyes and, and all the gross stuff. We picked a very benign picture of Jesus and said, hey, folks, if you, you don't need the myth to have the Mary. You can have the Mary and dump the myth, and, uh, and, and it works out just great. And we figured that that would be uh, a, a nicer billboard, an easier billboard. But the Catholic League doesn't make any money when I put up nice billboards. So... Even when we put up billboards that are more mellow, like this one, uh, they freak out because that's how they make their money. These two guys earn a living off of, well, me and American <laughs> atheists because they got nothing else to complain about except people who complain about their, their church. Um, and they blow it out of proportion. But what we have learned, and, and, and this is something that I want everybody to see really clearly here, what we have learned, and we've seen this over and over again, we, we've seen billboards that say one nation indivisible, and it's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing. We've seen uh, the people at Coalition of Reason put up, don't believe in God, you're not alone. And it's an affront to the Christian nation. What we have learned is that they don't care what these billboards say. They don't care what the pictures are. They care that atheists are speaking. They care that we're out, that we're in front, that we have the money to put up a $25,000 billboard in Times Square. They care that we count, that we matter, and that we're demanding to be seen. That's why they're going to take whatever billboard we put up, any billboard we put up, they will complain about it. I could put up a billboard with Bill Donahue's picture on it, he'd still complain. Because <laughs> it, it, it's, it doesn't matter to them. I mean, they'll say it's about the picture, but this is a benign billboard, folks. This is an easy billboard. 
This isn't hateful. This isn't spiteful. This, this You can't say anything bad about this billboard, except that we call Christianity a myth for the fourth or fifth time. This is not news. This is old stuff. This is easy stuff. They're complaining because we're talking. And that's why we're not going to worry about whether or not they're going to be offended. Can I ask a question now? I, I'm just curious. This is something we, we brought up last week. We're not sure – uh, because all media gets created for an audience, right? Like you're creating a media for an audience. Right. What do you want to tell your audience with this? Who are you talking to? Are you talking to a believer? Are you talking to somebody who already agrees with you? Are you? Ta- I mean, what is the audience here? Okay, this is this is a very this is the best question, Cecil. Okay, because the primary audience for uh, our billboards, almost all of our billboards, the primary audience is the press. OK, the press loves our billboards. That's and interesting. Gonna, and while they're going to be talking about our billboards, while they're going to be taking pictures of our billboards and putting it in their papers and on their websites, they are our primary market. Our secondary market are the press's readers who are closeted atheists who are on the fence. They are atheists by my definition, which is the broadest sense of atheists, includes agnostics and secular humanists and everybody else who, well, is an atheist. Uh, they, the, the primary audience is the press to get the word out because, you know, we, we don't make our money. We don't make our impact in Times Square. We made our impact by the CNN article on CNN.com that just went out to a million or two million viewers with the picture of the billboard on it, with the picture (laughs) and the link and the website. That's my target audience. Okay. And what are they talking to? They're talking to the people, the secondary audience, the non-believers who are not involved with the movement right now. The, the um, non-believers in this country range somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million people and the non-believers that are involved in the movement are somewhere around 50,000 people. That's one-tenth of one percent. That's one-tenth of one percent of the atheists who call themselves something that looks like atheists uh, who are doing everything that we're doing. That's one-tenth of one percent. If we made it two-tenths of one percent or three-tenths of one percent, what would Bill Donahue and his, and his partner do? I mean, it, it, the, the amount of growth that we have in front of us is huge. So it makes... It only makes sense for us to go for the low hanging fruit of the non of the closeted or unaffiliated atheist. The tertiary market is the believer not to not to convert. I do not think for a second that any billboard that I or anyone else could put up would convert a believer. But what we will do is raise awareness of atheism in the believer's minds. Make him aware that the atheists are out there. Make him wonder if we're all bad people. And I'm not going to shy away from this. Make them talk about it. Let's make the preachers, the the the, uh, the believers, talk about it. When we put up, you know, it's a myth. That first big billboard in front of the Lincoln Tunnel. The preachers preached about the billboard. Well, who are they preaching to? They're preaching to their choir. Who's sitting in that pulpit? Who's sitting in those pews on Christmas Day? Closeted atheists. The preachers are telling the closeted atheists in their own congregations about our billboard and about our organization. So it's important that people understand that the billboards that we put up are very strategic. Uh, They complain a lot about the font on the billboard. I (laughs) I will go on record here saying that everybody who wants to complain about a font on an American atheist billboard, you might as well just pray it to me because that's how much attention. (laughs) Uh, It's so unimportant to me. What is important is the press and the reactions that we're getting. Uh, from the non-believers and from the believers. I want those preachers talking about our billboards to their congregations on Christmas Day. Keep the merry, dump the myth. How dare they call our myth a myth? 
<laughs> I think that's you know it's it's far more insidious than I had initially thought, and so I got to I got to say kudos to you and your marketing strategy because I think that is that is absolutely the best way to go about this. You're using CNN to broadcast your message, and and to be honest, initially I thought I thought to myself when I saw this and other billboards that you've done, I thought we're not going to convince anybody, we're not going to convince the other side about atheism if we are confrontational. But I see what you're doing. You don't really care so much about them. Who you're trying to reach already agree with you but don't know about you. And that makes a lot more sense when I see this. No personally committed theist is going to change their mind for any billboard. That's not that's 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 a that's an impossibility. Uh, We've got ninety nine point nine nine percent of our market to tap. Yeah. Tap that. Yeah. No, that's that's really good. That may that changes that changes how I think about it. Definitely. That's that's great to hear. Uh, So I'm really uh, pleased with how the billboard is going up. And I'm also pleased at the uh, rumors that I'm hearing. Uh, about a counter billboard from the Catholic League, uh, because that's just wonderful. Let's do it. Let's have it out. All that does, and, and, and do not be surprised about this, okay, because the Catholic League will put up a counter billboard because they know, and despite the fact that they know, that it'll give us a huge press bump, okay? They don't care about giving us a press bump. They care about taking some of that for them. Uh, uh, their their capitalist Bill Donahue is not stupid. He's incredibly misled and very very wrong. But he's not a stupid man. He's Machiavellian in his behavior, and um, I kind of admire that about him. You know, and uh, he's he's a businessman, and uh, I am expecting a counter billboard from the good folks at the Catholic League that'll say something really lame, like you know it's real. Keep them keep them. Keep the Mary and the myth or something stupid like that. <laughs> I hope it says keep the myth. I think that would be spectacular if they're like, yeah, well, we'll keep our damn myth. Thank you very much. And, and I would love that. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's important that you understand um, the the breadth of this movement and how this movement works and how the press works. Um CNN just put up an article online right now um, as we tape this. The front page of CNN Belief Blog is a picture of the billboard. And it's a story about the breadth of the atheist movement. And it talks about um, American atheists and our billboard and our punch religion in the face style. And then it talks about Greg Epstein over at Harvard Humanists and how they got together with a bunch of believers and did a food drive. Well, that's great. I have... No problem with that. But realize, and I hope everybody does, that CNN would not be writing about Greg Epstein's food drive without David Silverman's billboard. Okay? That's very true. That's very true. And and that's the big picture, isn't it? We're not only getting out one message. We're doing exactly the right thing. We're getting out multiple messages. We're, and, and the messages that we're giving is no matter what kind of atheist you are, there's a place in the movement for you. And that's a very important piece to, to go to, to, to get past. You know, some people uh, on uh, the uh, on the other side of the movement, on the uh, on the more accommodationistic side of the movement, they trash American atheists a lot. But without us. You're not going to get in the news. You're not going to get the press. Right. And you're not going to get the visibility that you will get with us pushing the envelope. Right. No, that makes sense. This is a lot more uh, strategic than I had initially given this credit for. So I, I actually very much appreciate this, you know, because I was getting pretty nitpicky about this on our last episode, you know, about, you know, the the the, the aggressive use of, you know, uh, keep the Mary, dump the myth. It felt like an exhortation to do something. And I felt like, you know, it's not our role as atheists to exhort people to action. Like, do a thing. Don't do another thing. Like, that's for the that's for the theists. I'm not here to tell people that they should do or shouldn't do things. That's, but the 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 fact that this is such a strategic move on your part in terms of manipulating the press and and in turn buying press for other organizations that otherwise aren't just aren't controversial enough to get any attention. That makes a hell of a lot more sense to me now. And. Uh, 
Yeah, that's that's I, I appreciate that very I, much. I got to ask a question, uh, Dave. Uh, can, do you guys ever get refused space on billboards? Do people ever say, get lost? We don't want your money. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, uh, uh, many times. In fact, right now we're struggling with the state of Pennsylvania uh, trying to find some billboard space for uh, a campaign against the year of the Bible. And all we're trying to do is put up Bible quotes. Now, they're not the nice Bible quotes. They're the bad Bible quotes. <laughs> but we're trying to put them up. And we are having a terrible time. Billboard companies are private entities. Yeah. And they have the right to refuse any customer they want. And um, and also, the larger billboard companies like Lamar and Clear Channel, they kind of have franchise systems set up. So the, the person in... Pittsburgh rules Pittsburgh and cannot be overruled by go- by corporate. So it, it, it's a matter of pleasing the individual markets. Lamar in New York would let us do whatever we want. Lamar in another city will not let us do anything. Um, we can't, We you know, a lot of people said, uh, you know, we put our, our Muslim billboard up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, instead of Dearborn, Michigan. Well, that's because nobody in Dearborn, <laughs> Michigan would put up our billboard. Nobody. Um, so we put it up in in in, um, in in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and and we attacked Islam that way. Uh, so yeah, they they will refuse us. They can refuse us. They have refused us, and they will continue to do so until we normalize atheism to the point where bigotry against us is so repugnant. That it can't be tolerated. So in five thousand years, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am very very uh, positive about the direction of this country. I am thinking of what I have promised, and my goal is uh, full atheist normalcy in seventeen years. Holy I, cow! I originally said twenty years, and that was almost three years ago. And I hold myself to it. Um, you have a better chance of walking on water there, Dave. I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Look what we've done in the past three years. Look how much we've come. Look how many podcasts there are for atheism now as opposed to five years ago. Look how many outed atheists there are uh, in every poll. We've got 30% approximately of the under 30 crowd. Now, in 20 years, that's going to be 30%. It'll yeah. be under 50 crowd. Yeah. And that's assuming no growth. So, no, I don't think it's a stretch at all. I think we are going to see atheist normalcy before I retire. Um, and uh, I'm very, very excited about the prospects of this growth. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in it. I think, we're, I think we're on the verge. And I think today's generation is going to watch this happen. I mean, think about what happened. Between the nineteen between nineteen fifty nine and nineteen sixty nine, okay, that's the decade of the sixties. Yeah, how much did the country change during the sixties? Was huge, it was huge. It was ten years. Yeah, you can do this. Yeah, and they didn't have the internet. Right, and they didn't have the money that we have coming in. They didn't have the power. They didn't have the momentum. They didn't have thirty percent. But all of a sudden, women have just about equality in this country. Black people have just about equality in this country. Very soon, gay people are going to have just about equality in this country. And and that's what we're looking for here uh, at American Atheists. We're looking for just about equality, uh, which is the best we can get. You know, there's always a diminishing return. Um, But uh, we're going to have that during our lifetimes. And it's going to be because we have a coordinated movement uh, that works along that, that works along multiple market segments toward a common goal. And uh, I think it will happen, and uh, I'm pretty confident that it's going to happen during this lifetime. You know, there's there's something that you said that just struck me a moment ago. You said a coordinated movement. Um, <clears throat> now, that's – isn't it, isn't it one of the problems, though, that, that kind of plagues and one of the things that, that makes it difficult for that 50,000 number to turn into the 50 million number, right, is that that – that coordination is what's key. And we had Sean Faircloth on this show a long uh, a while back, about a year and a year and a half ago, maybe. I don't know. Um, and that's something that he he spoke at length about is the uh, desire to coordinate the movement. Um, and that that to me seems like the essential component. It is, is, is to get those people together. And, and a lot of people, um, you know, we had the Reason Rally a few months ago now, uh, six months ago now, and. 
oh my goodness, nine months ago now. And, um, you know, it was the largest rally. It was the largest atheist event in world history by a factor of 10. A big, huge success. And that was in the rain. A big, huge success. And we all had fun and organizations were formed because of that. And people's lives were changed because of that. But I think the biggest victory of the Reason Rally is that it was the first time in American history that all of the atheist organizations got together behind one push. It was the first time that American atheists and the Freedom From Religion Foundation and CFI and CSH and, and JREF and AAA were all on the same page. AHA were all on the same page. Richard Dawkins were all on the same stage with money, with one direction. That was the first time we'd ever done anything like that at all. And it worked great. And one of the things that we learned from the Reason Rally, one of the many things we learned from the Reason Rally, is that not only can we do it, not only can we work together, but that when we do, the result is spectacular. And that's why, yes, the, the, the coordination is absolutely, it's absolutely essential. It is also the most difficult thing to do because we're all type A personalities. But... The, the end result is that we have seen the fruits of that kind of labor. We have seen how immensely positive it is when we get, remember, we had 30,000 people in the rain. The whole movement is 50,000 people. Okay, we did that in one, with only two years of preparation, but we did that uh, because we worked together, because we put all of our bullshit uh, to the side, and we actually worked toward a common goal uh, with money in hand. And I'll tell you something, behind closed doors, everybody worked together great. In our board meetings, every member of that board worked great together. Now, the Secular Coalition for America has its own challenges, um, but that's not because of infighting among the groups. That's because the Secular Coalition has its own unique issues. But I think the reason rally shows that although we're not a perfectly gelled movement yet by any stretch of the imagination, we are capable of it and we are capable of kicking ass when we do it. So, uh, so we're back with David Silverman from American Atheist. Uh, there's a big lawsuit that got uh, got announced today, David. Could you tell us about it? Well, uh, this lawsuit is something that we've been thinking about and working on for some time. A lot of people have been uh, talking about uh, how the IRS treats churches differently from other 501c3 groups. And uh, we are attacking the discrimination in the IRS tax code that is based on religious discrimination. Um Right now, the IRS has multiple different kinds of uh, 501c3s, and every 501c3 has to go through a process to become nonprofit, and every 501c3 has to pay uh, fees, and every 501c3 has to uh, declare its income every year, declare how they spend their money every year, declare their major donors every year. Every 501c3 has to do that unless... They're churches. Churches do not have to go through an extensive process. They do not have to pay fees. And most importantly, they do not have to file yearly I-990s like everybody else to declare how much money they make or how they spend their money. They do not have to justify how they are, uh, why they are nonprofit like every other nonprofit does. This is discrimination. This breaks equal protection. This breaks due process, and of course it breaks the First Amendment because it's discrimination based on religion. It also breaks the uh, Article 6 of the United States Constitution, which is the No Religious Test Clause. A lot of people think that the No Religious Test Clause talks about humans who want to become polit politicians, and that's true. The actual phrase is... Um, you can't have a religious test for any public office or public trust. 
Now, a 501c3 nonprofit organization is a corporation whose stock, what, what actually makes it a 501c3 is that the United States government owns all the stock. Now, that makes it a public trust. And, and if it makes it a public trust, that means that the United States is employing religious discrimination on different public trusts, to sp specifically breaking Article 6. So we have a multi-pronged approach demanding fair treatment from the government. We are not going out and saying, oh, you have to do it one way or the other. <clears throat> but we are saying that if you are going to treat American atheists one way, you have to treat churches the exact same way. And that suit uh, has been filed in the Kentucky court. Uh, we are very, very confident about it. Uh, th something that you should all know about American atheists is that we'll, we file cases to win. We do not file cases for publicity. We do not file cases that we don't think have an excellent chance of winning. I invite everybody to go onto the American Atheist site and read this case. It is extremely well written. We are, they are clearly breaking the first, fifth, 14th amendments and article six of the constitution. And we can show damages because American atheists has to hire people to to has to hire accountants every year. We have to file those forms. We have to pay our accountants. It takes about 200 hours a year to put together these forms, but churches don't have to. And that's discrimination and that's illegal. And that's what we're suing for. Wow, that's fascinating. I, uh, you know, good luck. I hope it works out. Is there, is there uh, now, I, I don't know, this might be a naive question, but is, is there a way that uh, that normal, like people who are atheists who want to help out with this, is there like a legal fund kick in or something like that that we can actually, do to help you out? Actually, there's not only a legal fund kick in, there's actually a legal fund match uh, because one of our donors uh, saw the early form of this lawsuit and put in $100,000 as a match uh, for anybody who wants to donate to this specific lawsuit. You can do that on the atheist.org website, and all of your donations to this lawsuit will be doubled. Wow, that's awesome. That's, that's a deal. That is great. So I, we're really happy about that, and I'm really uh, grateful to you guys for letting me talk about this. Oh, this yeah. is, this is um, you know, American Atheist was started by Madeline Murray O'Hare, who, was, who, who went to the Supreme Court and took prayer out of public schools, took forced prayer out of public schools. And this is the kind of suit that we filed. This, the World Trade Center suit, um, this is the kind of stuff that we file, the stuff that will change or pro change our lives or protect our lives. And uh, government-sponsored bigotry is just not American. And uh, we're not standing for it anymore. We're going to fight it. So we have a couple of questions from listeners I want to I want to ask you. Uh, Ryan asks, um, do you think that Fox, the Fox News audience is reachable? If so, why? If not, why appear on a show like, say, O'Reilly or one of the other shows that you appear on? OK, 90 um, percent of the Fox audience is not reachable. OK, they're not. Uh but when I go on Stuart Varney or when I go on O'Reilly um, and they treat me badly, I went on O'Reilly recently, and, and I'm not exaggerating here. Six Christians called me. They went way out of their way to call me and say, you know what? I don't agree with you, but I don't think you're a fascist. <laughs> Or a pinhead. Yeah, or a pinhead. It turns out he called you a pinhead, too. He called you a pinhead by not calling you a pinhead. That was my favorite part. What, what, I, what I love about going on Fox News, and what I love about going on Fox News is not the reason that I go on Fox News. What I love about going on Fox News is that I am given the opportunity to make them look bad. Stuart Varney, if you look at the recent Stuart Varney video, if you look at the recent O'Reilly video, they look bad when, yes, they, they do. when they treat me poorly. And I look great, and that's fine. And then the video goes viral so people on our side can see how bad their side is because our side doesn't watch enough Fox News, in my opinion. Our side kind of escapes from Fox News. They don't want to watch that crap. But if they don't watch that crap, they don't see how bad that crap is. So it, it's important for our side to see it. So if my si if my appearances incent our side to watch them abuse me, that's great. That that motivates us. 
The other reason I go on CN on, on Fox News is because CNN watches Fox News, MSNBC watches Fox News, CNBC watches Fox News. They look, they see me, and then they call me, and that's why I go on Fox News. I go on uh, Stuart Varney, and I get a call from CNN the next day. They want to do an article on me. I just did an, uh, my first interview today with Time Magazine, and there's another one behind it because of my appearances. On, because of my appearance specifically on O'Reilly, the reporter saw it. So it's publicity for me. It's awareness raising for us. Yes, it's a little bit of convincing in their audience. Some of them might get heard. A lot of them will see the bad side of their side. And that's a good thing, too. Well, that's interesting. So, yeah, that- it, it, it actually works out. Pretty well, you know. There are some shows, I, and I'm not going to do any more Laura Ingram. I really don't like her anymore, um, and I'm not going to do any more Mike Huckabee um, because of what he said about the school shooting. Good for yeah, you. That's ridiculous. Good for yeah. you. I, I'm not going to do him anymore. I, I did want to ask too because we have been like sometimes. This you have a you have a fucking hard job. I will say that flat out because having to sit with O'Reilly and have a conversation with that man and not just. I mean, not just want to slap some sense into him because he's he's talking about how Christianity is a philosophy and not a religion. And I mean, he's just going (laughs) off the deep end, basically. But there's been a couple times. And again, I'm going to be I'll be up front with you. We've been critical of you in the past. Specifically, there was a there was a there was a a bit that you did or a show that you did where someone was asking you questions about the hurricane preparedness. And this Uh was this was a while back. Somebody had said, uh, you know, hurricane preparedness. And there was a moment there where it felt like uh, you wanted to talk to them about how they're like you wanted to to argue with them about how their God should act if their God were to exist. And it felt a lot like you were kind of rolling around in the mud with them where I felt like you might have wanted to stay above that conversation. You sort of brought it into uh, I don't know. It it felt a little too uh, it felt like you were playing on their court, so to speak. Do you feel like sometimes you get drawn into into arguments that you might not want to be in? Well, sometimes I, I know what show you're talking about. It was that was also a Stuart Varney show. They uh, they kind of uh, ambushed me for that show. They came. They 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 brought me in. I was supposed to talk about parsonage taxes. Uh, <laughs> that's and, a totally um, different that's, story. That's what I prepared for. I, pre- I prepared to talk about I see. parsonage tax rebates. Then in the limo on the way to Fox News, they called me on my cell phone and said, "No, we're going to talk about the hurricane." Uh, all right, we're going to talk about. The hurricane. I'm not a meteorologist, but okay. We're going to talk about what atheists do in the hurricane. Okay. It's kind of weak. It's kind of lame. <laughs> then I sat down with Stuart Varney. And I was, this is Fox Business. And so Stuart Varney is my first appearance on his show. He says, now listen, uh, we're not going to have, this is not Fox News. We're going to have a civil discussion here. And I was like, all right, good. Now nah, We'll have a civil discussion. And then they we went live, and they ambushed me, and all three of them. And this woman on my right, she 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 oozed ignorance. She just <laughs> oozed. I don't know who she was, but I mean, it was like she had the word "duh" written on her forehead. She was she oozed ignorance, and 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 she was talking to me like she was some sort of intelligent person. And it really, really <laughs> pissed me off. And yeah, I really kind of got into it. And, and and then she started screaming. And uh, well, she started screaming, guys. And, <laughs> and I, I, I absolutely loved it. And I remember that moment very specifically where I chose to pull Epicurus on her because she was screaming because I knew it would make her scream more. <laughs> and I was, and there was a time when she was screaming and I was silent. And it, 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 may, it may have been short on camera, but in my mind on, on camera, it was a long time where I sat silent and let her screech at me. <laughs> and I just loved it. So, so the answer to your question is, yeah, sometimes I get drawn into something that I really shouldn't get drawn into. Um, but sometimes... I am thinking about, you know, how does this look? And specifically with that argument, I was certainly thinking about how this screeching woman 
looked screeching at me about, well, why would God stop it if he made it? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was, I, I absolutely love that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I tweeted after that screech on you screechy diamond. because <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that makes us look good. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. I could have, I could have taken a little bit of a higher road there, but, not much. I wanted to keep them engaged. Well, that's, and I that's, to keep them engaged. that's a good way to go about it. I do have a follow-up question to that specific one about Fox News. Of all the appearances you've had on Fox News, the one that stands out to me, of course, is the O'Reilly look after he went on with the Tides. You became a meme after that, uh, the yeah. look, that look. But is that is that your favorite appearance, you think? Or what's been your favorite appearance that you've had on Fox News? One of those moments where you walk away, sort of dusted off your collar, thinking, I had those suckers all day. Uh, that would be my most recent appearance on, on O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, when, when he stuck his finger in my face and said, don't you tell me what I'm thinking. And I stuck my stuck my face in his finger and I said, oh, yeah, I'm challenging you on it. I'm telling you you're not telling me the truth. Um, I, I thought that was uh, a great appearance. And I'll tell you something. After the show went dark and after it was all over, O'Reilly, oh, and I, I, I've said this before, O'Reilly is a performer. OK, he is playing a part. Off camera is different from on camera with Bill O'Reilly. So the camera goes off and he looks at me and smiles and I smiled at him and we knew that we had made ourselves some good television that day. <laughs> and, and, and I was very, very pleased with that performance. I was very pleased with him on that performance. He let me speak. He made a fool out of himself by calling Christianity a philosophy. I was all set with that performance. That was my that was my happy place. I got another question here from a listener. Uh, this is sort of changing. This is shifting gears a little. Uh, a listener asks, "What big?" Uh, this is Richard. Richard asks, "What big atheist skeptical conferences are coming up?" Well, the biggest one uh, is the American Atheist National Convention. And that's coming up at the end of March. And this is going to be our 50th anniversary convention, uh, which means that we were planning on making it the largest convention that we've ever had. The last convention that we had was um, in Washington, D.C., and it was the largest atheist event of the year. We actually beat TAM last year. Wow. Um, and this year we intend to do it again. Uh, I will say that it looks like we're going to sell out our hotel and we're going to have to go to a second hotel. But um, this, is, this is going to be a, a fantastic convention. Um, we have A.C. Grayling is coming. He rarely comes to, uh, to anything in America. Um, but we also have uh, Congressman Pete Stark is coming. And we have J.J. French, the lead guitarist of Twisted Sister. <laughs> and he's coming. And check it out. He is the sober... Uh, the, the sober, non-drug-using atheist member of Twisted Sister. So it, he's got a really interesting story to tell. Uh, he's the he's the band leader that doesn't uh, have sex with every groupie. He doesn't <laughs> do drugs. He doesn't fall down drunk. Um, he brought in Dee Snyder. He started it. He's the captain of the ship. Uh, he's the reason Twisted Sister w was a success. And, and he's a hardcore atheist. And he came to us. To speak, we didn't go to him. He came to us because he wants to speak to the atheists, and uh, it, it's going to be a fantastic convention. That's going to be in Austin, Texas, and and you know what? I, I want to mention this because this is an important question. It's an important thing. Why a convention is important is an important topic. When I first started coming to these, going to you know any sort of involvement in this movement, I went to these conventions. And I skipped the talks. I didn't care about the talks. Eh, sometimes I went. But a lot of talks I skipped because the real reason that I went to these conventions was for the socialization. It was for the fun. It was for the experience of walking into a room with 200 other atheists. Well, now we're going to have between 13 and 1,500 atheists at this convention. And it's going to be fun. We're going to have a live band performance from Quiet Company. We're going to have a bar crawl. We're going to have affinity parties. We're going to have a costume dinner where you can come as your favorite the, the, the rules for the costume dinner are come as your favorite god, 
biblical character or whatever. Oh, no. <laughs> you are going to have – I just want to – I'm going to call it a now. You're going to have a Brazilian Muhammad. Oh, we love Muhammad. <laughs> Muhammad's come a plenty. Uh, we have flying spaghetti monsters walking all over the place. Uh, it, it's going to be our third annual. So the, the point that I want to make is that some conventions are more fun than others. And as president of American Atheists – I want to make sure that everybody knows that I think the most important part of a convention is the fun. People come for the fun, and when you leave, you're going to remember the fun. Yes, you will remember hearing J.J. French. You will remember Pete Stark. You will remember A.C. Grayling, and you will remember Cara Santa Maria, who will come and talk about uh, who will come and talk about some some new discoveries in neuroscience. Uh, you will remember some of the great speakers that we have coming, like Christina Rod and Hammond Mehta um, and, and uh, Catherine Stewart. But you will also definitely, definitely remember the fun at an American Atheist Convention. So, uh, with no bias at all. I can say that you should come to the American Atheist Convention because it is going to be the convention of the year. Easter weekend, we always have it on Easter weekend. Because <laughs> um, what is a, you know, atheist, what are we yeah. going to do? What else nothing. are we going to do? The, 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 the hotels are cheap, the flights are cheap, and we get nothing else to do. And we get to have a party in the hotel on Easter Sunday when all the Christians come in their little coats to go to the ho- fancy hotel dining room, they see all the atheist stuff all around. But that's kind of – that's not really it. But um, it, it's going to be a really fantastic time. Oh, i got to tell you about the Bat Bridge. The, there's this bridge right next to the hotel. And it houses over a million bats underneath the bridge. Cool. Okay? And every night at sundown – all the bats leave at the same time in this huge cloud of bat <laughs> leaving the underside of this bridge. And we're going to be able to watch this happen every night. Uh, it, it's just going to be a fantastic event. Um, and uh, I will tell you that it is selling out. Uh, it is going to sell out and it is selling out quickly. We are about to sell out of the hotel. We are about to go to a, uh, uh, a second hotel. Um, so if you want to go in on this, you want to get in on this, it's at atheists.org and you can register online. And that is going to be the convention of the year. So I, I do have a question. So it's, it's related to the bats, actually. So every night the bats go in, the bats go out. Never a misunderstanding. Never. You can't explain <laughs> you it. Can't you explain just can't explain it. it. <laughs> <laughs> They go up, they go down, they go in, they go oh, out. Oh, man. There's never a miscommunication. Never. Absolutely wow. never. <laughs> that is impressive. Yes. Doesn't that deny your entire movement, Dave? I mean, don't you feel like you see the bats go out and you're like, man, if they come back in, you've got to seriously <laughs> reel down. There, there, goes, there goes everything. We're going straight to church right afterward. <laughs> Take the A off of everything, boys. It's now the theist convention. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. It, it, so, so that's going to be a, a great time. I hope everybody comes. That's awesome. Uh, it's, 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 it's my intention to make it the most fun event of the year. All right. Well, uh, well, David, uh, if, if we wanted to find uh, American Atheists on the web, if we wanted to find you on the web, where would we look? Well, you would find me. Uh, the, the website is atheists.org. It's a nice, memorable email, a nice, memorable domain, atheists.org. And uh, I have my Twitter handle. Uh, courtesy of Stephen Colbert, it's at Mister Atheist Pants, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's something that uh, uh, that's a moniker. I was looking for a new Twitter handle, and Colbert came out on his show and said, "Hey, Mister Atheist Pants, you look too much like the devil." And I was like, "Ah, oh, I'm keeping that." So. <laughs> yeah. When when a king of comedy comes up with your Twitter handle, you don't just fucking throw that thing away. You keep that. Oh, that's mine. Yeah, I grab it. It's mine. Yeah, awesome. It's, Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today, David, and thanks for explaining uh, explaining all of the, the tactics that you use. It really changed my mind. Uh, Tom is, is – you're not going to change Tom's mind, but you changed my mind, <laughs> so thank you very much. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thanks for letting me air this out. You know, we all have to communicate more. We are in one movement. We might have different motives. We might have different methods, but our motives are the same and our intentions are the same, and guess what? We are going to win this, folks. We are going to win. So thanks for having me on and enjoy the ride.